Today, what I want to talk to you about is, as you can see the title, Leveraging Technology to Aid in Creating a Nonprofit Athletics Club. The term athletics stands for outside of the U.S. is, is track and field and cross country. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is a little bit about how I use technology to create a nonprofit cross country and track and field running club in my hometown. Thinking about how I'd use technology to organize a meeting. How do we collect liability and consent forms from parents? How do we communicate with club members? How do we recruit club members and advocate for club members? And um, how can we share important documents? You can see where I'm going here, the tips, different types of technology that you might be thinking about. And then what technology do we use at, at uh, pro after school running practices? And so we're covering several different types of uh, technology across all of the, the textbook. What might you do to organize a meeting? What technology might you use to do that? You're wanting to set up a face-to-face -face meeting. But like a doodle, right? And, and this is something I use in my research is Sign Up Genius. I don't know if anyone uses that one. That's another scheduling one, which is a little bit more, I like allows me to be the power holder and see where people yes. are at versus each other, see where they're at. So Doodle Poll, it allows you to send out a bunch of meeting time options to multiple people via email or you know text messaging or whatever. It's it's a internet based link. And then the people go in and they click which time slots they are available. And then you can set the meeting based upon when the most people are able to meet at that time. I'll show you how to create it in a second, but you can see that February 4th, 10 to 11. So you would enter your name here when this is sent to you. You would click all the time slots that you are available. And then here we can see two, three, four entered when they're available. When are we gonna have this meeting? On Wednesday the 3rd from two to three. There you go, okay, it's pretty pretty simple. I'm on their website, doodle.com. Enter the title, we're gonna say PE um, meeting. We can add a location or not. So we're gonna say the school gym and uh, you can, in here for the note, you might discuss what's the purpose of that meeting. So this is free, this, what we're doing right here. I'm going to pick what are the time options. So what's really unique too, is that if you are doing a Zoom meeting, um, you, it will automatically adjust time zone differences if, if you're working with people with different time zones. If meeting here is gonna be one of the options is November 5th from 11 to 12. We'll do 12 to one. We'll do Friday from 11, 12, 12 to one. So there's four different time options. You could even set this up for parent teacher conferences potentially. In that one, you'd probably use more sign up genius. Uh, sign up genius, you can also assign tasks like, Who's going to bring the um, bottled water to practice? Um, who's going to sign up for that? Or who's going to be in charge of uh, um, bringing the snacks, those types of things? You can limit the number of votes per option. So let's say if you're wanting two people in each of the meetings, two, two parents, two sets of parents, then you might have something like that. Limit options to a single vote for each person. And then here's where you're putting that, where your, your information is. So then you get an automated email and you finish it. And now it uh, generates a link. And so I'm gonna copy this link. So here I'm sending out the link to the chat. Go ahead and click that. Go ahead and click the actual options. Which, which option do you think that you would be able to attend? If you're trying to meet up with five or more people, it's really hard to just take, create a text thread to figure out what's the best day and time for everyone. So in a more of a professional environment where you're trying to meet up with a bunch of different people, Doodle Poll is a really good option.
So that's what we did, try to set up who could attend a meeting to, to create these ideas for this after-school club. Could I just ask real quick, uh, like a thumbs up if you've used Doodle before? So only, so only about maybe less than half the class has. Okay. Because I would say like, like Dr. Jenny and I probably use it on a weekly basis probably as maybe every other week as, as college professors or you get one. I get, I, I sent one out um, last week to try yeah. to set up a meeting that I was hosting. So yeah. I yeah. get them quite often. Okay. So now how do we have members register for the club and collect liability and consent forms? What's the technology you might use? Who's registered for a 5k before? Well, one of the things we had to factor in is that how much the club was going to be charged for using this online registration service. We ended up going with a company called Get Me Registered, but my previous club that I was a board member of, we used a, a website called Run Sign Up. Get Me Registered is a little bit more expensive where it, they take like a percentage of every transaction plus like a dollar figure. However, the benefit to that is, is that we do not have to collect hand-signed liability waivers, and that's what it makes it so much better. So let's show you what this looks like practically. Here's what run sign up is. And so you can find a race. You can put New York City. Now, not a whole lot of races going on right now. So here's the registration for Get Me Registered. Individual adult mem re member registration. We, can, we also have an option for people to donate to our club here. We click on that. The kids' registration is closed because we had to limit registration to, due to COVID. Here's the statement of agreement and waiver of liability. We use the main Get Me Registered liability information. Listen, I don't want to mess with liability insurance and waivers and everything else, but in the day and age we're living in right now, you have to. Typically, you do check with your school district to make sure you're covered for any school-based activities. But if you're doing things outside of school coverage, what we did is we became a USA track and field as well as a Road Runners Club of America affiliated nonprofit. And we get $1 million of, of general liability insurance through Road Runners Club of America. So here's where people put in their age. If they're registering a child, then they have to to be 18 years or older and then they sign the electronic waiver and then we collect a lot of different information so for an individual adult member you can see the types of stuff that we collect is really basic um, email is really important and we'll get into why would we be collecting email because we use this system also to email and communicate with club members cell number emergency contact information for the kid registrations the child ones the other things that we collect are things like what grade they're in, wh who's their teacher, who can pick them up from practice other than parents, those types of things. Huge benefit to that is, is that we don't have to mess with any paperwork. It's all done electronically. When we started, the one of the last chapters of your textbook is about looking for funding for technology, right? Well, what I did is I applied for a grant through Roadrunners Club of America to get some money. We got shirts, we got a battery operated wireless speaker. So we got things for the club because we went and we applied for funding. So if you are in a district or a situation where you don't have a lot of money, it's always good to take a talk to the administrators, talk to the school board, talk to the booster clubs, but then after that, look for outside entities or community-based entities that may give you money so that you can purchase technology or whatever for your organization. So these are up to $1,000. I got $900 through a grant from the Roadrunners Club of America. And as I said, we bought a little bit of technology. If we click on the grant recipients, we'll see. Grove City Athletics Club right here, 2018.
Let me show you what it looks like behind the scenes for Get Me Registered. If you were to ever set up a, when you are doing a fundraiser, in my experience, people think, well, let's do a 5K. Well, that's fine if you want to do a 5K, but this is also the type of system that you might use to get registration for a community-based fundraiser 5K. We're using it to have people register for a running club, but you can also use it to have them register for a one-time event like a local 5K. So there's an admin por portion of their website. And let me show you what it looks like behind the scenes here. So I'm gonna log in. And so here's the different options that I have. This one is I use the most. For 2020, there's 132 registrations in our club. And I can click email event registrants. I can, I can choose to only email the family membership people. I can choose to only email the individual child memberships. Those are the different options here. So the email's coming from me. Um, you can change that and then set, write the body of the email. Now, the one thing that I don't like about Get Me Registered is they will not allow me to attach a document to their email system, which is a total pain in the butt. So if I have like a flyer I wanna send out to people, I have to go and upload a flyer to our website, then copy the link, the URL to that flyer, and then paste the URL, the, the link to the website into my email messages out. And that is something that I don't like about this system. Yeah, you have to work through some of the pros and cons to different types of technology like that. The other thing that's unique is you, you can set up when that email notification will be sent. So I'll just show you some of the different types of messages that we'd be sending out would be like different announcements. So I'm gonna go to some of our archived announcements. This was an announcement that I would have sent through that system where, hey, you can order your clothing now. The deadline is Monday, August 24th. Don't forget, here's the link to it. And it, I would send it through that system to all the people who registered. So is that just for like running events or can you do it for other types no, of- No, yeah, that's why it's called Get Me Registered. Yeah, you could you could do it for anything. It could be a wrestling tournament. It could be a triathlon. It could be, you know, a basketball tournament. What Whatever you want to use it for, the, the company will assist you setting up the registration questions that you want collected. So if I do um, edit, and then here's all the different tabs that, is built into the system. This is sort of like behind the scenes, things that you would change. So that's like the general page. Here's questions tab. And so I wanna know who's their homeroom teacher. So I put, that's a unique question that I put in there. What's, what school do they go to? One thing you, that's unique about our, our club is that we, we have public school kids, we have local Christian Academy kids, and we have homeschool kids. So it's good to know where the kids are coming from so you can track sort of numbers. We have different information. Here's who is gonna be picking them up. We also, this is a really important question, what are the allergies that they have? So that if we have a kid that has a, you know, a bee allergy, we wanna know that. And we did have um, a major bee sting accident at practice last, uh, last year. We also collect and have the parents go through essentially the PARQ, the physical activity risk questionnaire. And then they sign off that their kid is physically able to attend practices. And if they say, that their a physician has told them that their child has a heart condition, then we want the, we want a note from the doctor before they can start practices. So this is all the type of stuff in teaching and coaching that you probably have never even thought about. And this mm -hmm. is the type of stuff that um, is the real world situation of when, when you actually get into the trenches and, and you're doing more of it yourself that you sort of have to deal with the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, Dr. Jenny, I'm just going to yes. uh, uh, just jump in for a second. So, you know, I, some of my students know I have a big background in adapted, right? And I ran a sports camp that was not affiliated with the school. Oh, yeah. Um, that's uh, Camp Abilities for Kids. With, I think you all might have one, too, at, at uh, Slippery Rock. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But um, they have a huge one at Brockport for yeah, um, that's visually the, impaired kids. Yeah. So we used to run that. And I used to, and this is like 10 years ago now. I mean, and I, the... 
amount of medical data I would get from the kids oh, was sometimes geez. pretty intense. Uh, yeah. And, you know, literally sometimes if they get hit in the head, their eye might pop out. Literally would be oh, on, the, on the document, right? And now this is 10 years ago. Now we use, I think, Eventbrite to okay. have them sign up, which is very generic. Yeah. Yep, I've heard that one. Yep. But um, at the other end, we would, this is not probably what you want to do. So what Dr. Jenny just showed you is a much better idea is we would basically scan all that. Their pa <laughs> we would give them paperwork, scan it and put it in. And at, we still, I think, use Google Drive or whatever and thought yeah. we were being savvy, but scroll through those, each person to look at every single thing. What he's talking about, it's a really streamlined thing. And, and when I did these camps, there's 15, 20 kids. And if you're talking about you know, more like, oh, geez, getting more than that. You're talking, so this is a really nice streamlined process he's talking about. You remind me of the people that would bring like one of those portable filing cabinets of like all the documents and all the things around with them when they're coaching. Now, if, if a kid is not picked up from practice, I go onto my phone and I look up online, what's their phone number of the parent or the, then if they don't answer, I look up the phone number of the other parent or the, you know, the other caretaker, whoever it is. And I don't have to carry any paperwork whatsoever to, to get that information right online at, and, um, when I'm out on a field. Food allergies, right? Like those are <laughs> like something like that, like to know that and then not, and then especially if you're moving from uh, uh, field to field and you have two different people, one person has the paperwork. Um, yeah. Great, great stuff. So. I have a quick question. Yeah, love a question. How, how are the pa <clears throat> parents' feedback of this website? Like, do they enjoy it? Is it a lot easier for them to go <laughs> online and everything? The registration system, if they're signing up a, a child, it's pretty extensive. So they don't love the um, initial registration. And every year they have to re-register because if their medical issues can change. So it could take 15 minutes to register. But beyond that, I get a lot of really good feedback from the amount of communication that I have with parents. And they know that whatever email address they put in the registration system as the pro quote unquote prime email, um, then that's where all of the notifications are gonna be sent to. So there's no question of missing information. There's some times where the email may go to a spam folder and you have to check that, but we tell them to add the email address of where these emails are coming from to their distribution list um, of contacts so that those come through. But other than the main amount of time with collecting all this information, it, they're fine with it. The other thing what happens is, is that you can see here there's um, payments. We can, I can look up to see in every, I think, three months, our club bank account is connected to get me registered so they do an automatic payment which is a direct deposit to our club checking account if you've ever tried to collect checks from your friends it's hard enough to get one person to give you to give you money when you owe it if you imagine if you were like doing a a pe shirt order and you started collecting checks from every parent who wanted to buy a pe shirt from you do not do that you need to set it up so that you have a system that all payments are done online so that you're not collecting any money from anybody. Um, it's, it's a pain to, to try to, to get money from people. So that's another great way. A downside to this is if it, we've had somebody like donate our club 50 bucks through this system. Well, if they'd given me a $50 check, I'd get all $50. But if if they do the the donation through the website, then get me registered is getting like a transaction fee as well. So that's you know you you're paying for that technology. Ways that we communicate and market with our club. You're all laughing at Facebook, right? However, Dr. McNamara, do you use Facebook? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I use Facebook. So my point is the demographics of the of the parents of these kids are my age. They're like 35 to 50 years old. These people use Facebook. <laughs> They're not on TikTok. Okay, some of them are, but my point is, is that you have to know what's the demographic of the people you're trying to communicate with and then use the technology that they're typically using. So that's not the only form that we use, but um, so we have a Facebook page. The main mode of communication of like certain announcements 
is to send an email. The main mode in which we are trying to generate advocacy for the club so that the community sees us doing these activities and promoting running in the community and getting kids running and families running is Facebook is our biggest factor. We, you know, we had the newspaper run one article um, when we first started, but one thing I do want to call your attention to if you're not as familiar with Facebook is we have two different pages. We have here what we call the public page. Anything we post on this page, anybody on Facebook can view it, okay? We have certain administrators who can post on that. And so let me show you a little bit of behind the scenes, the public page. So I'm an administrator in here. And what's unique is you can go on there to see how many people have been reached by certain postings. You can look at for in, across October 8th to November 4th, we've reached 1,200 people based upon our postings. And then engagements means that they've clicked on it they clicked on a link, they've commented, they've liked it. We've had 1,400 engagements, which is up 19% from the previous month. And the, the page likes are the total number of people who have liked our public Facebook page are now following it, that they'll see updates for it. So this is sort of behind the scenes how what Facebook is. If you're ever, we don't do any type of paid advertising, but a, a lot of marketing goes into that. If you're in it, sort of a for-profit type of situation where you're wanting to get more traffic there, then you might get into the, um, the paid piece to it. So based upon people hearing about our club and a lot of times people who don't have kids, but they're like grandparents or relatives of the people that are in a club seeing this, you know, we've Every year we see we receive multiple donations. One of a local physician gave us a five hundred dollar check last year, just based upon hearing about us through the community. And a lot of times it's through Facebook. So this is the public page. I'll just scroll down. You can see a lot of different videos that we can post on there. I'll just put running specific articles. I'll throw up on, on there that people can. Um, see, here's our, our high school team just won the district championship. So that's the public page. Now, we also have what what they call a public group in Facebook. And we this is the title for it. And people get confused because they think that we only have one Facebook page. But this is a private group that you must be invited by somebody who's already within that group or you have to request access to it and one of our administrators can allow you to be into it. And this is where we put a little bit more private information like, hey, I'm going running on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. at the park. Does anybody want to join? I wouldn't feel totally comfortable putting that on the public page, but I feel a lot more comfortable posting that on this more private group page. We ask questions when they enter it. It's like, do you live in the Grove City area? Are you interested in track and field and cross country and distance running and walking? And are you willing to become a, are you interested in becoming a club member? We do not require them to be a club member for this page, but some people might. More of these private pages, you can attach when you go to click and add a post, and you click the three lines here, you can add a file. If I try to do that on a public page, and I don't know, I don't know the rationale for this. I guess so people aren't putting files that have viruses on there. That is not, is not an option. You cannot attach a PDF file on a public Facebook page, only more of these um, private groups. So that's a little bit about the way that we advocate and market and recruit. Um, we definitely get people will, this button right here is the messaging button. So people can send direct messages to the club through that. And we'll have people find uh, out about us through our Facebook page. And they'll ask about, hey, when are you meeting again to have a group run? And can you send me more information about the club? So when people Google um, athletic or fitness-based clubs in this area, our Facebook page comes up a lot. So we also do have a Twitter account.
it's not that overly effective in the sense of advocating for a club. We'll get a few interactions and you know we see here we only have 87 followers twitter is really good for um, following the latest sports news and that's one of the main reasons why we have a twitter account outside of that it's also really good actually for professional development and following people who post teaching and pedagogy types of ideas for that our textbook actually has a, a twitter account that has a lot more views uh, followers than our athletics club but we have a link to our website here and you know we, we post okay so our elementary team won the mercer county athletic conference championship recently and so we post some stuff but you know two likes two you know hearts or whatever and one retweet is not getting it totally done but some people in the community will follow us through that if you haven't yet i really recommend you uh, following uh, the our textbook uh, we have, we're, we're pushing close to a uh, thousand followers here, but we put a lot, we try to retweet and, and share a lot of technology focused things for uh, physical educators, health educators, and coaches on our Twitter account. And uh, definitely take, take a look and follow that. So then we also did create a LinkedIn profile. Um, it's really good for networking with other people professionally and sometimes when people do some searches within LinkedIn, they might come across our club. I really encourage you to have an individual LinkedIn profile. You can find jobs on LinkedIn. You can interact with other professionals. You can join specific interest groups within LinkedIn as well. Public health, physical education, coaching, American College of Sports Medicine, different types of interest groups that you might get involved in with LinkedIn. I go in and try to make a, uh, other connections. So I go into the network part of it and I will try to connect with people, try to get more name recognition for our club. And you can see we have over 300 connections for LinkedIn. Creating a website. Do so they have to create a website in your technology course? That is their final project. Oh, in what platform? Uh, they're just using Weebly. Okay. You can see here, I have some other examples. Um, Google Sites is really basic. Um, Weebly, Wix, those are some common ones. What's the topic of the website they have to build? Uh, it's it, they're, They have to make videos and, and add like their things that they've done in the class, basically. So it's going to be somewhat prescribed, like they have to add videos that they've created in class and then five other things that have been covered in the class and it's kind of a they get to pick and choose things that we've covered so almost like a portfolio a little bit yes we used joomla to uh, create the website but that was not my choice it was we had somebody who's interested in web design and they had experience with with that and they also purchased our domain name when you're selecting a domain name Obviously, no one wants to be typing something that's 25 characters long. So to really try to think about what ca it captures the essence of what you're trying to have the main theme of your website and condense it as much as you can. And so what we ended up using was Grove City AC for Grove City Athletics Club. And the other important thing that we did is that we, we made our domain name a .org rather to, to really show that we are a nonprofit organization as compared to .com, which is more for-profit companies. Honestly, I, I'm not in love with, with um, Joomla as a way to try to um, edit because it's a little bit more complicated than Weebly and, and Wix and Google Sites. Just to sh show you some of the different types of stuff of why we created a website, we have a tab called Apparel and we use the same company every time, but it's a, re it's a static, meaning it's not changing. I'll notify people when we have another order and then here's all the information about, okay, do I have to order a, a singlet, which is like the tank top version, if my kid's in the program, how, what do you recommend for sizing? Stuff that I would have to retype every single time I wanna send out an email and I can go uh, to do an order for clothing. Same thing with, we go to youth, directions to race venues. Well, obviously we, we run it the same cross country courses typically from year to year. So 
on the website, we have, all right, well, if we're running a home cross country race, what's the address to it? And I can send this link to other coaches from other areas so that they know how to get to our course. Here's another one in Buell Park. What's the address that people can plug into their GPS? These are things that once they're up on the website, you don't have to worry about retyping and finding that information. You can have it, it there and people, you know, find our information. Here's, if you want to be a volunteer coach with us, what do we require? Well, here's the background checks and here's how to access them and where do you send the clearance forms after you get them. So we require to be a coach the same types of clearances you would need to volunteer at the school type of thing. And this is all stuff that um, I don't have to mess with from year to year because it's all on a website. And that things like Facebook, it, it moves, it's not static, it, it changes. So if you wanna do adult group training runs, we typically meet you know, Sundays, 7.30 in the spring and fall and 1 p.m. and here, where's the location? Here's the links to our social media on the side here. You, you really need to be thinking about what are the main tabs you want people to access and then what might be the drop down options within each of those tabs to, to truly think about trying not to have too many tabs. So think about umbrella terms that you can use that access various locations of the website. That's the main benefit to a website is, is having this information there when people wanna find out more information and it doesn't change. Another thing that we communicate in market is create videos to put on our social media after we have certain events. You know, obviously you have the issues of, do you have permission to take pictures or videos of children, right? Well, the way that we do that with our club is that's part of the online registration process. I get permission to do that from every person who registers with our club. Now, if this was in school, you obviously, for EdTPA and for anything that's within the school, you have to go through the procedures of school for gaining access to post pictures and videos of children. But for the, the remember, this is an outside of school club, and we collect permission through our online registration system. So different types of running videos that we've made based upon the different activities that we have done with the club. GoPro footage of my son in a jogging stroller and we mounted the GoPro on the handlebar of it. This has got almost 7,000 views actually. Here's a, a GoPro that on my kindergartner. So here's still images. A lot of these images are just taken from iPhone smartphones. There's the GoPro that, with the chest strap. And then I uh, used Windows Movie Maker, which now is becoming obsolete, but um, it's, a, you know, you can use iMovie, Adobe Premiere Elements, these basic programs that all you're really doing is splicing still images with video. And then I'm going to show you in a second some websites that you can use to find copyright free music to add on there, which is pretty important. The kids love seeing themselves later on. So we post it on Facebook and we send out the email links to it and how you can set up varying um, access to videos. There's privacy settings that you can set up on there. Here's the vi visibility. So you have a few different options. These are a public. Anybody who searches on YouTube can find that video. Unlisted means only the people who have the link to that video can watch that video. So here's the link to the video. If I copied and pasted and set this as unlisted, if you went into YouTube and searched for the video, you would not be able to find it. However, if you had the link to the video, the direct link to it, you could watch it. The last privacy setting is private and that's where only the people who are logged into this YouTube account, which is my YouTube channel, can watch the video. So sometimes if I have a, a family video, uh, I sort of want to save for myself. I'll list it as private and I can go in and view it in my list of videos, but I'm the only one who has access to, to see that. 
here's like a listing of the different videos that I post on there. He, these ones are like screen capture videos that I use from my classes. They're unlisted so that the students can view it who, and I, and I pop, copy and paste those links into the learning management system. We have D2L. Um, here's free music archive. You can search for different music genres and then download the actual songs on your hard drive and then put that into your editing so video editing software so that you can use some copyright free music. However, you do need to list the artist and the song in uh, either the video description or the text on the video. Another one I like is called Ben Sound. Different types of, of music here that's copyright free. Again, you need to uh, list Ben Sound and, and typically the website. There's uh, varying rules that for those copyright free music options for that. Editing tips. Do not count on smartphones for capturing audio. Use um, wireless microphones if you can. Record horizontal, particularly with the iPads and, and, and smartphones. So that means holding it long ways compared to vertical up and down to avoid black bars whenever you try to post those videos later on. Definitely for physical activity types of, of um, settings, you want to consider using a GoPro for that. I talked about that. Here's some entry level. You do not need to use the, some of those more advanced Final Cut Pro or Adobe Pro for video editing. For the stuff that you're going to be doing, like for TPA and things like that, you can use some of those really basic editing software. Elementary practices, we will use a battery operated wireless speaker that has Bluetooth so that I can stand within 30 feet of this device and I can control the music that's playing from my smartphone to the wireless speaker. It has like a 30 hour battery life which is awesome. You can plug even a microphone into it. I don't use it for that, but some PE teachers might use a wireless headset and connect it with Bluetooth for that if you're in an environment where you don't lose your voice. But I strongly recommend these. This one has a retractable handle like uh, it's carry on luggage and there's wheels in the bottom of it and I can wheel it different locations so I don't even have to carry it. It plays a radio. Some of the coaches have subscriptions to Spotify and some of the music services. So we use that. Um, we use Kids Bop, which is K I D Z B O P, which is um, popular current music that uh, ha takes away some of the inappropriate lyrics. So that's something I recommend. Feedback. We talked about that in the public health planning process and evaluation process and do a, a survey monkey. And we asked questions about how satisfied they were with the club, why they join, what they think the strengths and what recommendations do they do they have for the club, as well as if we did group runs, what would be the best meeting location, day and time. So that's the type of real world situations of why we would use Survey Monkey or Qualtrics or some of these online survey um, systems to collect uh, information. But you know, so you, you might uh, use a survey to collect information about what parents might prefer to do for an after school physical education, fitness activity uh, program, or recommendations if you just ran a program to get feedback from, from people. Again, we do our shirts and our clothing order through an online vendor. Parents go on their website order what they want, pay with the credit card on the vendor's website, and then we, get, we go and collect all the orders. So we do not have to collect a single check. I strongly recommend that if you're doing clothing orders, which probably, if you're st in the fitness field, you're gonna be doing clothing orders, do not try to do the whole um, collecting checks, you know, $5 checks for t-shirts. Try to find an online vendor that you can do the orders and have everybody streamline the orders so that uh, they are paying the vendor and the shirt distributor and all you're doing is collecting the shirts. So that's a, a quick rundown of um, some of the technology I use to leverage creating and continuing to, to run the um, club. There's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter. Tech4HPE uh, is our Tech book, uh, textbook Twitter handle. 
but what questions do you have? My question is just like a curious question. What yeah. has like been the most like rewarding thing you've gotten out of um, doing like this athletic club? It's mainly right in line with our mission statement. It's to instill a joy for physical activity with the kids. So especially kids that are coming into the program where maybe their parents sign them up and they're wanting the, the parents want him to do it more than the kid does. And then they are coming to practice with 50 other 60 other kids that are really enjoying themselves. And then they really see their progress of their fitness is increasing based upon their, their running times are getting faster. And then they start to want to be there and they're really enjoying physical activity. So that's really the, the biggest enjoyment I get from it is seeing the kids develop and holistically both as, um, as uh, runners, but also as people in, in wanting to do lifelong physical activity. Is there any technology that you use to like reward them with like how they're doing if they do like a good job? Do you like yeah. have a fun day and let them watch? Good a question. Video? Some running clubs in particular will, there's something called the Billion Mile Race. It's sponsored by New Balance and they are geared toward having it could be PE classes or clubs tracking each um, kid's running mileage. And at the end, you upload the total number of mileage for your club or for your school or for your class. And then if you reach certain thresholds, they'll, they'll send you like water bottles or shirts or stuff like that. They're not really old enough. I think if I did focus on middle school, I might do a little bit of digital badges that they could share on social media but the these kids being second to sixth grade most of them aren't they're not on social media so as far as the digital badges go that would be an option if they were a little bit older you know they, they like finishing a race and getting a ribbon that's that's the type of rewards that they get um, or medals for like the certain top number of finishers as well hold in your hand t tangible rewards they like Thank you, Dr. Jenning, very much. Uh, it, it was very, very helpful to have you uh, come on and especially kind of give it with the coaching background because we haven't really hit that stuff yet. So thank you very much. Uh -oh.